All right, let's go into uh, part four of the butterfly effect. And today, let me see if I can wrap this series up because we've got some more things we want to cover in the next few weeks. You may remember each of these Sundays I've reminded you of where the phrase the butterfly effect comes from. 1960s, Edward Lorenzo was a meteorologist and a professor at MIT. And he studied meteorology to try to figure out why they kept getting it wrong. He wanted to improve the science, make it more exact. And so he was studying micro effects and how they work out as macro effects. Micro being small, macro being large. He wanted to know how small disruptions in in the atmosphere or in environments could actually work its way out into massive weather events. So he coined the phrase, a butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil, and two weeks later there's a tornado in Texas. And I'm not sure he actually ever tracked the butterfly down that caused all of that havoc, but it was the point was it was a metaphor for how small, seemingly insignificant weather events can begin in one part of the world and then pick up steam and end up ultimately having a profound effect elsewhere. And we're living through this right now with not only Helene, but now uh, Milton that just came through and uh, affected Florida, and then, of course, Helene all the way up in North Carolina. And we're living through the effects of somewhere in the world, a butterfly flapped its wings, or something happened that set in motion a chain of events that ultimately ended up producing over the waters of the Gulf of Mexico these monster storms that have impacted people's lives so so terribly. Now, that idea of something very small being worked out in a larger sense caught on far beyond meteorology. It caught on as a sociological idea, Uh, an event in politics, one single thing that can ultimately end up having uh, a cascade of effects that resonates outward throughout the world. Anyone remember, Nicholas and I were talking about this last night, anyone remember 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall? Do you remember seeing the video of that first chunk of concrete broken loose? And then another chunk broken loose. And then people are pouring over the wall. They're breaking it down. Something happened in that moment that has forever shifted the geopolitical landscape of the entire planet. One event. Somebody made a move. And you could say that with the assassination of Abraham Lincoln or John F. Kennedy. One of my favorite uh, TV series, and I often hate to recommend TV series because I don't remember what all's in it. And I hate to recommend something to you and you go watch it and go, oh my God, you mean this man watched this? Because I'll skip stuff if I don't, if I don't think I need to see it. But uh, there was a, a series, um, I think it was on Hulu. It was called 11 63 Of course, that's November the 22nd, 1963, the day that JFK was assassinated. This was actually a book written by Stephen King, whom I've never read, but this particular book, 112263, it's a time travel book. And so we're all familiar with Back to the Future. Anybody know that? That's one of the most classic time travel movies. But this book and this, and this movie series, it's actually a TV series of episodes, it, um, it deals with time travel in, in one of the most incredible ways. And what it is is a man steps through a portal, goes back to the time surrounding the assassination of JFK, and he, he interrupts, intervenes. He becomes friends with Oswald, and, and he ends up stopping what would happen. And then when he comes back through into his time, he realizes that by messing with, as the doc would say in Back to the Future, messing with the time-space continuum, he completely changed world events, and it wasn't for the better. And it's a fascinating, fascinating, one of the best treatments of time travel I've ever enjoyed. This is exactly how the kingdom of God comes in the world. And that's why it's such a big deal to me today. It's not just about time travel, although that would be cool if we find out that's actually possible. I think in the spirit, we actually can travel in time. I think God can go back and deal with stuff in our past. I think he can go forward and deal with stuff that's coming. 
But I think that that idea of a, of a small event having a large effect is how the kingdom comes. And this means that you and I need to understand that the things we go through are having a larger impact than we even know. And this is what I'm after with this whole series, The Butterfly Effect, is I'm wanting you to understand that when God takes you through times of trial, or when He allows the enemy to take you through times of trial, it is always because through that suffering you will enter into glory. Now this is not me saying this. This is the Apostle Paul saying it in Romans chapter 8. If we suffer with him, we will also be glorified together with him. And then the very next verse Paul says, because I've done the math. And the su the King James says, I reckon. But it literally means I've calculated. I've done the math and the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul says in 2 Corinthians that the light affliction of the moment. Is that how we're going to describe it? The light affliction of the moment. It doesn't feel light. It doesn't feel momentary. And I wouldn't call it affliction. I got other words for it, right? But Paul says the light affliction of the moment worketh. There's that ETH again, that Shakespearean ETH, which means action keeps on going. So he says the light affliction of the moment keeps on producing an eternal weight of glory. Light, weighty, momentary, eternal, affliction, glory. Paul sets up this contrast and he says what you're going through right now is actually the thing that is producing the maturity and the capacity for you to bear the glory of the Lord. The glory of God is weighty. The Hebrew word for glory literally means weightiness or heaviness. The glory of God has heft. It has weight. It has substance. And if you're going to bear the glory of the Lord, it will crush you if you have not been strengthened by times of testing to be able to carry the glory of the Lord. And let me say this to you. You've got to understand this. Because we are creatures... I don't know why I've got from the lagoon and all that stuff coming into my mind. But because we are creatures, because we are created beings, we cannot become one with the uncreated. We cannot become one with God. We cannot become one with the divine. Because we are temporal, we cannot become one with the eternal. Because we are finite, we cannot become one with the infinite without a process of transformation that allows us to become one with God. And this is the process that in your Bible becomes metamorphosis. Three times in the New Testament, I mentioned it last week, Jesus was transfigured before them. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. Beholding is in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We are changed from the same image from glory, into the same image from glory to glory. These three verses tell us that there is a process it's so good to see you. It is a process of transformation that is happening in our lives that if it doesn't happen, we cannot become who God wants us to be. Do you hear what I'm preaching right now? I want you to redefine, recategorize, reformulate, reappraise in your mind the process and the quality of what you're going through. I want to tell you that if you get the revelation of what I'm preaching, that when God takes you through times of trial, it is a cocoon that is meant to liberate you from being a fuzzy little caterpillar crawling along a shiny little green leaf singing, I believe I can fly. The cocoon is designed to liberate you from the limitations of flesh and to bring you into a place of union with the divine. God wants to be one with you and he wants you to be one with him and he even wants us to be one with each other. But that oneness, that unity cannot occur as long as we are still trapped within the mortality of this fallen flesh. So there's got to be a process. And that process is the cocoon. As I said last week, that process is your meltdown. 
Because the caterpillar doesn't just climb in the cocoon, strain himself just a little bit, and then produce wings. Oh, look at what I've become. Oh, it's not nearly that neat and tidy. I know when you signed up to follow Jesus, they only told you the good part. Mm, check your neighbor. Make sure their amen's working. <laughs> when you signed up to follow Jesus, they only told you the good part. Am I telling you the truth? Well, what if we really preach the gospel like Jesus preached the gospel? Stood up with his megaphone and said, I have an invitation for you all. Come and die with me. Whoo, we'd be thinking twice about, I'm not sure. I, but if you want to fly, you got to die. There's a process of breaking through. Now, let me explain why. Would you like to know why? You were created as spirit before you were flesh. The Bible says when a human dies, the spirit goes back to God who gave it. So you were created as a human spirit before you were embodied. We're not, we're not a body or a, a, a physical body having a spiritual experience, but we're a spirit having a bodily experience. That spirit that's looking out your eyes at me right now, that true you that was formed and shaped by God before time began, you were created as spirit. Psalm 139, I'm not going to take time to read the whole thing, but you really should do it as homework. Because Psalm 139 teaches us that before you were ever formed in your mother's womb, God knew you. And the word know there is intimate knowledge he knew you, as in he had a face-to-face -face intimate relationship with you. He knew you. The Bible even says he foreknew you, and he predestined you, and then he called you, and then he justified you, and then he glorified you. Paul said he did all of that in the past, and that was done from before the foundation of the world. Go read Ephesians chapter 1, and you'll find out that God purposed you before time began. You were purposed in Christ before time began. And God said, let me tell you what, do. I'm going to take a piece of me. And I'm going to breathe it out into the world a billion times over. And I'm going to multiply myself. I don't mean to say that any one of you are God. But I mean to say that you are the image of God. You are breathed out as an expression of God. And Peter did say that we've been made partakers of the divine nature. So before time began, you were a spirit encoded, embedded, engraved with the image of God. Now, what is the image of God? Well, we know what God is like. God, if you were to take all the attributes of God and categorize them, you would find that all of God's divine attributes fall into three categories. God is love. God is wisdom. And God is power. In fact, that corresponds to the very triune nature of God himself as Father, Son, and Spirit. For God is love. Christ is the wisdom of God. And you shall receive power. Power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So love, wisdom, and power are, are inherent to God's own nature. God doesn't just produce love or, or behave with love or get up in the morning and decide today I'll, I'll, I'll be loving. No, God is love. It's the very nature of who he is. So your human spirit before time began was encoded, embedded, engraved with that image. That means before time began, you were pure love, wisdom, and power. So God said, and he breathed you into the embryo of the conception of your father and your mother's love. Now, here's the problem. Your spirit came embedded with the image of God, with everything you were ever meant to be. You've got to get this. If I can get you to get this, it's going to change the way transformation happens in your life. Okay? Instead of looking way off somewhere in the distance to try to figure out how to imitate something outside you, you're going to find out that what you need to become is already in you. It's already in you so that you're not living like a hypocrite trying to be something you're not. 
That's the problem with most Christians. They're trying to act Christianly. They're trying to imitate Jesus from way across the room. Not understanding that it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. For this cause I bow my knee before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom every family in heaven and earth receives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power by his Spirit in your inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all of the saints what's the breadth, length, depth, height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, and to be filled with with all the fullness of God. Now to him. Come on now. That's Ephesians 3. You need to go home and read that. And then the very next verse is understanding all of that. Now to him who is able. Somebody help me quote some scripture now. If you're going to do it, I need some vibrato in your voice. We're going to have to do this anointed. Don't give me none of that flat, flat quotes. I want something with some power in it. So say it with me. Now to him. Ooh, sing it with me just a little bit. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we're able to. Mm, I need somebody on the organ right now. Able to do exceeding, abundantly, above all we are able to ask or think. Mm, and right there is when my Pentecostals run the aisles and my Baptists just politely nod. Come on, now help me out. I keep picking on you Baptist folks. Y'all, y'all are amazing. I'm just teasing you. I don't care if you come from the Catholic or the Baptist, the Methodist, even got some Lutherans in the room. My God, what is happening? We love you, Pastor Bill. He's doing an amazing work, amazing work in the Lutheran church. I'm so excited for what he's doing. Able to do exceeding abundantly above all we would ask things according to the power works within us. And there's where we begin to shout right there. He's able to do more, but we forget that last line. According to the power somewhere across the room. The power way off in heaven somewhere. The power that, that, that the pastor carries. Or no, the power that is at work within you. So here's the deal. You were born as spirit. And within your human spirit was imprinted the God code, the secrets, the mysteries of everything God ever meant you to be. Your purpose, your plan, everything in you. The problem is, is you were embedded into a fallen, fleshly, mortal, dying bloodline. Mm. you picked up a lot of stuff from your family of origin. Now, we're not going to dishonor our father and mother. My mother's in the room today. I got to be nice. (laughs) My kids are in the room today. I need them to be nice to me. But the truth is, our parents were carrying a lot of stuff, stuff they didn't ask for, stuff that they went through. They were the product of their own trauma. And then we came into their life And we picked up the generational legacy. We got lying honest. We picked up lust and greed and pride. Rejection, defensiveness, anger. In fact, the works of the flesh are manifest, Paul says. Galatians chapter 5. The works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, hatred, variance, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings. What a list. And he says all that stuff comes out of your flesh. All that stuff comes out of that fallen bloodline. So here you are created by God to be this image of God bearing spirit. And yet you are embedded within all of this brokenness. Embedded within that Irish temper. Embedded within that tendency toward alcoholism or addiction, that tendency toward being a player. Don't look around now. The, 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 te- the tendency, the, the, the tendency toward sin. What happened to us? What ends up happening is because we live from fear, the flesh gets control. 
So when you get saved, when you hear the gospel and the spirit comes to dwell within you, the spirit of God is breathed into your human spirit and God awakens within you the God code, the spirit genetics of who you were truly meant to be before you got misshaped and deformed by your family of origin. There are three forces that we're born into that we have to deal with, the flesh, the world, and the devil. Ephesians chapter 2, the flesh, the world, and the devil. And so because we have to deal with those three things, we struggle our entire life to be who we really are. And then everyone at some point in their life reaches a place where they're tired of living a lie. Now, some people will just override it and go on and do the lie 2.0. But there are other people who say, no, I'm not going to keep on living the lie shaped by the expectations of people, by the rejection that I've experienced, by the addictions that have enslaved me, but I'm going to be free. And the Holy Spirit then unlocks within you. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. Think about it every night and day. Spread my wings and fly away. Are you hearing me? And when the Lord wakes that up in your spirit, he then invites you into what Paul calls the fellowship of his suffering. And this is when you go into times of trial and testing that shake you until you feel like you're coming apart. These are the things that rip out your soul. These are the things that seem to disembowel your heart. These are the things that when you begin to go through them, I'm talking about, I don't know what your situation is, but it could be a divorce. It could be bankruptcy. It could be a cancer diagnosis. It could be the loss of a parent. I don't know what all you're walking through. I know for myself, I entered into a cocoon in 2010. It happened the week that I turned 40. And I'm not fully out of it yet. But I went through a period of completely remaking who I am. This is why I've told you I'm not just preaching you a sermon. I'm preaching you my testimony. And I've been through places of pain. If I can be transparent with you guys today. Am I going to let you down if I tell you the truth about me? I know you guys think pastors are up on pedestals. Well, maybe sometimes. And then I fall off again. So I don't, I don't mean to let you down, but there have been times of trial so deep in my life. If I hadn't had wife and children, I wouldn't still be living today. I wouldn't still be here. Moments when I absolutely believed the world would be a better place if I wasn't in it. That's awful, isn't it? And it's a lie. It's not true. The world is a much better place because I'm here. I mean, let's just, let's just be honest. <laughs> I wish Gina was in here to watch me do that. Lord, she loves to roll her eyes at me. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm telling you, I actually do really believe that I'm meant to be here. And I believe that I'm a blessing to the world. But I have been through times, are you hearing me, when I did not believe that. I say I didn't. Down in my spirit, I knew better. But up here in my fleshly mind, and I just want to, I want to preach this message to someone. I'm wrapping it up. But I want to preach this message to someone because there are people in the room going through times where you're being dissolved. Your whole persona that you shaped in order to survive through the expectations of your family and your friends and the world around you, you became something you were not meant to be. It's true for every one of us. And now Jesus... He's trying to bring you into that place of fully manifesting the image of God. Now, let me just say this. I don't mean becoming like so many people in the world where it's like, well, I am just who I am and you got to deal with it. No, I don't mean that. What I mean is the who I am that you got to deal with is probably a distorted sense of who I am. I want to become who God says I am. I want to become who I actually am deep down inside my spirit. 
so that I can say when faced with the temptation to anger or lust or greed or pride or gluttony or any of the other things, I can say when my flesh says, you want that so bad, you wanna, you're you angry and you want to tell somebody off and you want to you get even. Do you know how many times in my life I have wanted to get even? Does anybody know all the things I haven't said on Facebook? If I had a dollar for every post I wrote out and then deleted, I'd be a rich man. Okay, stand with me so you'll know I'm quitting. The reason I'm preaching this, brothers and sisters in Christ, listen to me very carefully. The reason I'm preaching this is because you've got a decision before you. Are you willing to join Christ in the cocoon and be melted down, completely reconstructed? Are you willing to let him take you apart and rebuild you? Are you willing to allow all of the false self-image that you have developed through the pain you've walked through? Are you willing to allow him to chisel all of that away like Michelangelo carving the David? And they ask him, how did you carve such a beautiful masterpiece? He said, all I did was chip away what was hiding the reality underneath. That's what God wants to do with you and me. I'm... I'm sure this is probably not going to be popular and it probably isn't going to make millions of people want to hear me speak. And I don't really care. I'm after one thing. In order to be like Jesus, you've got to let him take you through the times of brokenness. Breakthrough breaks through the broken heart. Breakthrough breaks through the broken heart. I want you to yield yourself to Jesus. This is what I'm inviting you to. Yield yourself to Jesus. He knows what you're going through and he's going to take you through it. If there's anybody in the room right now that's in the cocoon, if you're in that place of suffering, I want to speak life over you today. It's not going to last forever. You're going to come through it. And like I told Gina a while back when walking through a very, very difficult time, I said to her, Gina, I'm finally at a place in my life when I can't wait to meet me on the other side of this because I know I'm going to be a better husband, a better father, a better pastor, a better human because I'm going to be more human. I'm going to be more the human I was designed to be, more the person he created me to be. So Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we lift your people up before you right now and we say give us grace for the meltdown. Give us grace for the cocoon. Give us grace for the times of suffering and let us know that never is it punishment, but always it is purification. And let us be purified by the refiner's fire. Take us through your fire, O God, for our God is a consuming fire. Take us through the refiner's fire so that we may be united with you, that we may become one with you. Graft us, O God. Meld us, mold us, shape us. In the mighty name of Jesus, it is so. Can you just lift your hands before the Lord with me right now? Give him thanks for his word. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, and you me spirit of 
the living God fall fresh on me Whew, I feel the breath of the Spirit in this room yeah. thank you Lord how about we worship him one more time give him praise lift up praise clap your hands all you people shout to God and give him praise you are so good Lord Thank you. Many blessings to you all as you go out into the week. We're going to give you an opportunity to give today. They're bringing the contribution box forward. You can also give through online giving. You can text any amount to 84321. You can also give through um, myfreedomlife.com slash give. On the welcome card in front of your chair, there's a QR code if you prefer it that way. Just making it easy for you to be able to give. I'm looking for partners. I'm looking for financial partners. People who will say, I believe in the vision of this house. We not only need to meet the need of covering the expenses and the cost of our present operations, but we want to prepare for the future by putting money back and in order to do that, the expenses of this building are obviously very high. The cost of just doing ministry is very high. So it takes a lot of money to operate every month. Your consistent, faithful giving is what makes it possible. I'm looking for someone where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I'm looking for someone who will put your heart and your, your resources and invest in this house. Would you become a partner with me today? Would you say, I want to give regularly and faithfully to this house, and I want to, I want to bless you. I, I, we're going to bless you if you give a dime. It doesn't matter. But if you'll become a partner, there is a blessing that is released in partnership that is special and unique, and I want to invite you to help us do this. Let's get this wagon up the hill. Amen? It'll be fun riding down on the other side. Father, I bless your people. I bless their finances. I bless their wealth. I bless their investments. Father, I bless them to be able to get out of every debt. We say the spirit of debt is broken. The spirit of poverty is broken. We say in the name of Jesus, miraculous and supernatural debt reduction and elimination. In the name of Jesus, the spirit of mammon must yield to the almighty God. So in Jesus' name, be blessed. Your finance is blessed. Your income blessed. Anybody in the room want an increase of income? Ooh, if you don't have your hand up right now, I don't think you're telling the truth. <laughs> Anybody want an increase of income? Lord, bless me. How many of you would be generous if God would give you more? How many, how many of you? Come on, it's a, it's a setup, so watch out. How many of you would be generous if God would give you more, would you? All right, well, let's reverse it. Be generous, and God will give you more. That's the way it works in the kingdom. Be generous. Be generous with what you have. And let's let the Lord use you in your giving. Today, you're going to be an incredible blessing. We like to close at Freedom Life by asking our worship team to come back. Our prayer team is coming to the front. If you need salvation, if you need healing, if you need encouragement, our prayer team is here to minister to you. Our worship team is going to come back and do what we call overflow, which means if you'd like to hang around a little bit and soak in the presence of the Lord and worship a little bit deeper, you're welcome to do so. You may need to go right now, and you're certainly welcome to do that as well. I want to put God's blessing on you as you go out into the world and be salt and light everywhere you you go. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Do you receive it? All right, go change the world. <laughs> God bless you all. Have a great week.